For current events, let's take a look at the world population. And we're going to compare it to uh, the world population thousands of years ago. Human beings have increased occupation of many continents in the Let's take a look at world population. The world population has continued to grow for thousands of years. But there was a time when human occupation of various land masses or continents or places on Earth were very small populations. And relatively speaking, considering the millions of years of evolution and occupation by other organisms, human beings, especially modern human beings, have only occupied these land masses or areas on Earth for a fairly brief period of time. Most recent count, total human population today, according to the world clock, is about 7.7 .7 billion and increasing every second. We have some terms that we will use in our discussions, and you've already read in some information, that we're going to create some standardized definitions for these terms. Now you can find many of these definitions in dictionaries, textbooks, um, but some of them with the slight nuance actually mean a little bit more than what you might find in some of those resources. Communicable. We're going to define communicable as transmissible or pathogenic organisms that can be transferred from one person to another. A more general definition could be diseases that could be transferred from one person to another. But we're going to focus on infectious diseases, the ones that are caused by microorganisms. Contagious. Diseases or microorganisms that can be transferred from one person to another, we're going to add a descriptor, easily transferred. So if we describe something as being contagious, we're going to say that means that the disease or the infectious microorganism is easily transferred from one person to another. And that's how the term is used. We often even describe something as being highly contagious which implies a fairly rapid, easy transfer from person to person. An infection is, is an unwanted growth of microorganism, either in or on the human body. We always hear about infections. We have microorganisms growing in and on our body naturally, but an infection is the growth of an unwanted microorganism, essentially in the wrong place at the wrong time. Pathogenic means disease causing. A, an organism that can cause disease or an infectious dis organism, infectious disease, is a pathogen. And then we're just going to modify that term as a descriptive referring to pathogenic, disease causing. Virulence. Virulence is the severity of the signs and symptoms that the pathogen causes. How sick will it make you? Will it simply give you a headache and an upset stomach, or can it possibly kill you within a week to, to 10 days? And then transmissible. Transmissible simply means you can transfer the infectious organism from a place to a person. Could be a doorknob, tabletop, soiled dressings that were on a wound even in the air. So transmissible means you can transfer a microorganism to a person um, through a variety of means. Now for these terms, we have to sometimes read between the lines or read carefully when we hear reports in the news. When they describe an organism as being transmissible, that actually means it could be more easily transferred to a number of human beings in comparison to something that's contagious or communicable. Contagious or communicable diseases do require person-to-person -person interaction of some level or some kind. Transmissible simply means 
It could be transferred to a human being from an inanimate object, such as a fomite. A fomite, F-O-M-I-T-E, could be essentially a doorknob, soiled dressings from a wound or an infection, or any other inanimate object. It's a constant balancing act between us and the pathogen, or the organism that's causing disease. During a lifetime, it's always sort of a teeter-totter, or you know who's going to win in the end, if you will. And unfortunately for many of us, it's the microorganism or the pathogen, pathogen that does succeed in tipping the scales. So we're always balancing good health with the possibility of disease, especially infectious disease. And what are the factors that can contribute to us becoming sick with a microorganism or having an infection or disease associated with a microorganism? Well, we have various portals of entry and portals of exit. A portal of entry is any area on the human body that a microorganism could gain entry. Orifices are ideal portals of entry. Nose, mouth, eyes, ear, mucous membranes from our various body systems like the respiratory tract, gastrointestinal tract, genitourinary tract, and the conjunctiva of our eyes. Breaks in the skin, parenteral routes if somebody's injecting or inserting some kind of device into our body. You can't find an unparalleled access other than sticking a needle or some kind of device through your skin or into some place or portion of your body that could provide a better pathway or entry point for an unwanted microorganism. The number of invading microorganisms does make a difference. Some microorganisms, pathogens, require a fairly hefty number to be injected into your body or gain entry into your body. While there are other pathogens with what we call high virulence that you only need a few hundred of those pathogens to gain entry to make you sick. If we look also at some of the what we call virulence factors produced by these pathogens. Virulence factors are chemicals that we find in or on the structure of the pathogen itself or produced by the pathogen that allow it to adhere to our tissues and to our bodies. In fact, that's the first ideal step for any successful pathogen. It has to adhere to us. If we can prevent that pathogen from sticking or adhering to our own cells and tissues, then we can prevent the progress and further infection. Once they've gained entry in sufficient numbers and they've stuck to us, then there are additional virulence factors that are found on the outer surface of the pathogens that allow that pathogen to penetrate and essentially colonize, start to grow. Once they've grown, then they can disseminate or spread. In fact, those are the three steps of an ideal pathogen, adherence, colonization and growth, and then dissemination or spreading throughout the rest of the body, our bodies. As they do so, they cause damage to us. We call that cytopathic effect or pathologic or, or abnormal changes in our cells. Cyto means cell, patho is referring to abnormal or deleterious. So direct damage to our individual cells and eventually possibly even causing death or destruction to some of our tissues and cells. Acute versus chronic disease. An acute illness is one of short duration. I'm talking hours, days, maybe a couple of weeks. Like the common cold, that's considered an acute illness. Chronic diseases, on the other hand, are of much longer duration. We're talking weeks, months, years, and in fact, some are incurable. Once you're infected, it 
essentially is with you for your entire lifetime and you either have continual experience of symptoms and signs of the infection or maybe even periodic but you do know you have a chronic active infection for a lifetime. Infectious diseases have stages. Some of these stages can be longer than others, but if we use an acute infection like the common cold as a typical example, on the x-axis we're looking at time. Again, time could be hours, weeks, days, or in the terms of chronic infection, weeks, months, years. On the y-axis we're going to include the number of infectious agents, meaning the number of microorganisms. For the first stage, we have what's called the incubation period or stage. In the incubation period, the microorganism is adhering. It's gaining a foothold and there are no signs and symptoms. In other words, our own immune system, which is the one that responds to and is alerted to the presence of these unwanted um, microorganisms, uh, have not started to respond or if there, if there are some factors that are responding, they're not causing any change in our, you know, how we're feeling in our condition. So incubation period, the pathogen starting to adhere, trying to get a foothold. As the microorganism begins to establish that colonization and growth and the production of some virulence factors, to gain that foothold, then our body's immune factors do start to respond. And we enter into the second phase, which is the prodromal phase. In the prodromal phase, we have vague symptoms. This is where you actually can, let's say you're standing on a railroad track. You can feel the train coming down the track, but you can't get off the railroad track. That's kind of a rough analogy, but that's what the prodromal phase feels like. And you probably have had this feeling where you know you're getting sick and there's nothing you can do about it. So the vague symptoms could be a headache, maybe a backache, slightly achy joints, muscles, upset stomach a little bit, just vague symptoms that you know you don't feel good, or at least not at your best. It's at this point that the pathogen is, again, starting to grow and gain entry into the next phase, which is the invasive phase. In the invasive phase, it has grown, and now it wants to proliferate and spread. And it's going to proliferate and spread, depending upon the type of pathogen or infectious agent or microorganism, and what it's capable of and where it's capable of growing. We start to see the signs and symptoms increasing in severity. By signs, we're talking vital signs, something objective that can be measured, like a fever, heart rate, respiration rate. A symptom is subjective, level of pain. How nauseous is it making you? How much of an, a gastrointestinal upset do you have? So signs are objective, measurable changes due to some kind of pathology or abnormal development of condition in your body, and symptoms are subjective. We eventually reach the acme of this invasive phase, which is now described maybe as the symptomatic phase. Now you really are symptomatic. It's really very obvious that you're ill, and this is when you have your worst bout of whatever it is that's making you sick. As we progress and our immune system starts to fight off and possibly with the aid of medication, um, defeat, if you will, or minimize or reduce the number of pathogens that are making you sick or cells of infectious agents that are making you sick, then hopefully we enter into the decline phase of this symptomatic phase. We start to feel better and slowly but surely we get to the fourth phase which is the convalescent phase. The convalescent phase is the one that most people tend to ignore nowadays or at least not give sufficient time for. 
And the convalescent phase is when your body does need a little bit of time, or maybe a lot of time, to rest and recuperate, to repair those damaged tissues and cells. And unfortunately, with today's busy world and the many demands that often face us in the workplace and at home, we don't have time to undergo convalescence and let our body repair itself. The other possibility, once we've reached the peak or the acme of the symptomatic phase, is we don't have any resolution to that condition and instead we die. So the stages uh, or phases of infectious disease are pretty consistent, whether we're talking about a highly virulent pathogen like Ebola virus or something like the common cold. But we're aiming toward looking back in history. With this, these concepts, even though these are modern concepts, realize that our ancestors recognized them too. Human beings, even prehistorically, we can only infer from some of that, but at least from the most ancient historic records, we can decipher or determine that our ancestors also determined that phases of disease and these types of conditions and terms, even though we have sort of modern terms and definitions, um, did occur. If we look at prehistory, prehistory means just that. It's before writing had been invented. But how do we determine the prehistoric types of disease or medical treatments? The only thing we can do is infer from the archaeological remains that we can find on Earth. Skeletal remains of human beings or related individuals like Neanderthals, other types of uh, a species of Homo, Homo sapiens. Sapiens is the modern human, but there are a lot of other um, species that have existed that are relatives of ours, Homo erectus in particular. And how do we figure that out if we're just looking at skeletal remains? Well, fortunately, the modern tools investigating ancient DNA in the last several years has really um, advanced significantly. So scientists are now able to take small samples of ancient DNA and rebuild profiles of what types of pathogenic organisms or the condition of the person that the remains are from. So there have been very significant advances in understanding diseases of the ancient world um, far better than even just a few years ago, thanks to new modern genetic technology. Whenever we look at our relationship with a microorganism, we look at conditions that we call symbiosis or symbiotic relationships. A symbiosis or symbiotic relationship is where we're living in intimate, close association with another organism. And we have those kinds of close relationships all the time with either non-harmful or very beneficial microorganisms that we take for granted. We just don't even notice them. It's the one that catches our attention, the pathogen. That's the relationship that can cause us some problems. And those types of symbiotic relationships have been established and developed over thousands of years as different individuals came in contact with one another, whether it was Neanderthals or different species of Homo or, or human beings, um, plants and animals. And it turns out that human beings, especially Homo sapiens, tend to want to travel. They're, they're often just moving from one geographic location to another um, and have been for tens of thousands of years. So everywhere they go, they encounter new microorganisms and new individuals or possibly new animals living in that environment. And microorganisms are exchanged all the time, or have been, for tens of thousands of years. 
for some more common terms, some of which we've already defined. A pathogen, a disease-causing microorganism. Symbiosis, two organisms living in close intimate relationship. And then we're going to further find, you know, define symbiosis based on who's benefiting and who isn't, or is there any harm at all. A mutualistic or a mutualism is where we have a symbiotic relationship that both benefit. Commensalism is symbiosis where one benefits and one is not harmed. And that's the probably the 99% of microorganisms living in and on the human body. We call these microbiomes now. And they're large communities of very diverse types of microorganisms that differ depending upon the area on your body. There are different microorganisms essentially live and colonize on your feet compared to, let's say, at the inside of your nose. But they're all beneficial or they're all just doing their thing and not causing you any harm. It's the microorganisms that cause harm that catch our attention. And those are the parasites. Parasitism is a symbiotic relationship where one organism benefits and one is harmed. And for some, over thousands of years, we have in fact established a long-term relationship with some types of certain types of parasites. Some parasites have essentially adapted to the defense systems and the body systems in the human body and found a great place to live in our bodies, even though they are doing us some harm over the long term. But the ideal type of parasitic microorganism is one that doesn't often immediately kill the what we call host, the person who the parasite is living in or on, um, but instead can establish that chronic relationship where we have that long-term interaction between pathogen and infected individual or host. These are all types of symbiosis and in fact there are other kinds of symbiosis that you can hear about um, from other resources, but we're just going to focus on the parasites, the ones that can make us sick. And in fact, a medical term that essentially means the same kind or similar kind of microorganism is a pathogen. So pathogen is more of a medical term describing a disease-causing microorganism, and a parasite is more of a biological term describing or defining a relationship in terms of, of intimate close living relationships. But in both cases we're looking at some kind of organism that's causing us harm.